I want to go ahead and get started, though, answering one of the top questions people have about God. And that involves the idea, if God is good, then why do I have bad days? But here's how I really want to frame it. What do I do when I'm at the end of my rope? Now, I hope maybe you were thinking of a more inspirational charge message. No, 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 no. But we talk about real issues that we're really plagued with because life can be hard at times. But there really is a God who has real answers, real comfort, real perspective, and real strength for our, for our worst days. So we want to lean into that. What do I do when I'm at the end of my rope? When I've tried everything and nothing's <laughs> working. A while back, my wife and I were out in Colorado for some ministry, uh, and we went whitewater rafting while we were there. I think there's a picture of it, whitewater rafting. You see me, look at that face, man. I mean business. I mean business right there. Probably could have got a better picture, but that's where we're at. Um, there's my wife looking beautiful, smiling, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost right there in my brain is what I'm doing. I have found this to be true. When we got into the raft, we were aware of the dangers that lied ahead. We were aware that we would be confronted with the current, current, that we would have a bout with boulders, that we would have conflict with cliffs, that we would have to navigate the terrain of the white water rapids of Colorado. We knew that. And so when we saw the rapids ahead, we would uh, embrace for impact. Matter of fact, I was almost thrown overboard several times. Some of them was because my wife was pushing me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but never, never was I about to be thrown overboard in a rapid. I was mostly thrown overboard. I lost my balance, if you will, when I was surprised by the boulder that lied just beneath the surface. Beyond my scope of sight, there was an obstacle that I wasn't um, perceiving to be a threat. But when we hit that sucker, it about threw me overboard. Have you noticed that life can be like that? It's not the obstacle or the challenge that you are, in, uh, that you are anticipating that can throw you uh, off kilter, that will wreck your faith, that will cause you to start deconstructing, if you will. It's the unseen boulders just beneath your perspective that has a way of hitting you and taking you out. What do you do when you wake up thinking life's going to be one way, but then throughout life, throughout the day, life be lifing and challenges be confronting, and you find yourself struggling to stay afloat, keeping your head up? Uh -huh. What do you do? <clears throat> what do you do when you're at the end of your rope? There's the big question. The Bible has big answers. And so to this, we're going to have a case study. Psalms 56. David, this is the famous giant slayer with a slingshot. Most people know him as just the giant slayer. He was a fierce warrior. He was a great king of Israel, but he was also an incredible poet and musician. If he was around today, his songs would be topping Apple Music and Spotify, and Taylor Swift would be opening up for him, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the Bible says in Psalms 56, this is a header for the song that we're about to read. And it gives us some context to the text that he did not write this anthem, this song of praise on the height of a mountain of celebration, but in the depth of defeat and despair. For the director of music, this is a song, to the tune of another song that David wrote entitled A Dove on Distant Oaks. Now, we don't know what that tune sounded like. Maybe it was an R&B song. Here's a dove on the... We don't know. We don't know. But we do know there's a song, a dove on the distant oak. Now, that's important. Keep that in the back of your mind. This is a mictum. A mictum was a fancy word that meant gold. So watch this. This is a golden mystery of truth that he discovered and he cashed in, not when life was great, but when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. He was where he was supposed to be, and his enemy came and seized him. And it was during the season in which he was seized he discovered the gold of security. Like a dove flying to a distant oak, he cashed in something that would sustain his soul. David, what is it? He tells us. Here's how it begins. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. 
all day long they press their attack. You can almost hear the wings of the dove begin to begin to flap trying to find sense in all of this, trying to find security in all of this. Where do you go when your life is chaotic and it feels like you're being driven away by the current of life in a raft? My adversaries pursue me all day long in their arrogance. They won't stop. Many are attacking me. So now it's not just one issue. It's several issues that are pressing against me. When I am afraid, I, I don't flap my wings harder. I don't squawk louder. I don't run in circles. I put my trust in God. We have an anchor for our soul when our soul is being driven by the, by the current in, of challenges in life. Let me explain it this way. I've got a prop for you. I got a prop for you. Let's let this thing right here represent. Thank you, sir. Let's let this represent a sense of security. This ring represents a sense of confidence and security. Uh, life isn't better, but something's keeping us above water. Something's keeping us from totally drowning. Life is pressing, but I fully haven't given in to panic just yet. Life is hard, but I'm doggy paddling. I'm doggy paddling. I'm still making it. When our life is thrown at sea, watch out now. <laughs> Summer job, 1993, lifeguard. When life, when life is hard and we're drift at sea, we're going to find a sense of security and stability in something. We're putting our hope into something. I would say it like this. Our hope is the rope. Our hope is the rope that will either bring us to shore or we'll give ourselves too much freedom that will cause us to drift further and farther from God, farther and farther than safety. We're going to put our security into something, and we're hoping something to happen with that sense of security. Our hope is the rope. So the question on the floor then is this, what's at the end of your rope? When you are at the end of your rope, what do you find at the end? Some people will tie their hope to their bank account or to their profession, or their career. They find their identity in what they do and in what they do, uh, um, uh, doing for them, right? Their career, their paycheck. The problem with that, obviously, is that your sense of security and confidence then is only as strong as the stack in the bank. But if something happens to the economy, if, so if something happens to your job, if your entire life is built upon that, then that grows farther and farther away. Some people will try to find their sense of security and identity in a relationship, in a marriage, uh, in, in proximity to someone or something. And the problem with that, obviously, is your sense of security then is contingent upon their ability to reaffirm who you are and what you do. But if they don't have the right words in a season, if they don't have the right frame of mind or the presence to give you what you need, Hey, why would you limit your hope to someone else? Some people, some people, they put their, their sense of security and their identity in their children's education or in their children's choices or in their children's accolade on the sports field. And I would just want to say, get alive. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. It's not their job to validate your identity. The Apostle Paul said it this way because he's been down down the river a few times, and he says it this way. He says it this way. I've tried everything, you guys. I've tried it all. I've tried this and that. I've tried to be somebody. I've tried to be a Pharisee, a Pharisee. I've tried to be a scholar of scholar. I've tried to be an author. I've tried to be a... Man, I've tried it all. And nothing helps bring a lasting sense of security for my a peace. I'm, I'm still a dove in flight trying to find an oak of refuge. I'm at the end. You see it? I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? I've tried the podcast and I've read the books and I've attended the conferences, but nothing seems to help. The answer, thank God he found it. Thank God God showed up. Is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life, in this circumstance. So to everybody who feels adrift at sea, God is going to right that wrong. 
He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. Isn't it true that life is filled with contradictions? Part of me is a man of faith. Part of me is a man of fear. The things I want to do, I can't do those things consistently. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Paul says, life is filled with contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart. I know I need to find God. I know I need to pursue God. But then life gets in the way and I get distracted. It's hard for me to stay disciplined, he's saying. But, and and then I'm pulled by the influences of society and this culture and influencers on, on, on social media. No, 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 it just drags me down into sin to do something totally different than that what I want to do. So let me ask again, when you're at the end of your rope, what do you find? What are you tied to? Oh, when you're having a bad day, you'll find out real quick where your sense of security and confidence is. Paul is letting us know, David is letting us know, there is an anchor for your soul. And if you're tethered and if you're tied to the right anchor, though the challenges of life are real, there is still a confidence, there is still a courage, there is still strength, and there is still peace for the dove to land. Come on, let's get our joy back. Let's get our strength back. Let's get our confidence back. Let's get our trust back. Let's get our faith back. If you're ready, say, let's go. Let me give you three anchors that we have in Christ. These are the characters of Christ. Once we're aware of the character of God, we're able to anchor a bad day in him, and it provides rest and peace and confidence and joy and courage for our soul. If you're ready, one more time, say, let's go. Yeah, let me give you three anchors for your soul and then a playbook of what to do when you're going through a rotten, no good, awful, despicable, bad day. (laughs) First anchor we have for our soul is this. God is all powerful. Come on. God is not surprised, nor is he taken by surprise, nor is he too weak to do something about the thing that you are worried about. The Bible says that God is all powerful. The same God who created the sun, moon, and the stars with his voice. He didn't have to work it up. He didn't have to mix ingredients together. No, by his voice. Let there be light. Boom. The Bible says there was light. Let there be vegetation. Boom. There's plants. The same God who spoke the cosmos into existence is the same God who the Bible calls calls closer than a brother. The psalmist says it this way. His hand is not too short that he can never reach out and take hold of us and pull us from the miry clay or from from the depths of the ocean and bring us back to shore. One of my favorite attributes about God is that God is a lifeguard. Come on. We got Baywatch Jesus up in here, right? Probably doesn't wear, well, never mind. But uh, I love the fact that God is all powerful. But not only is he all powerful, the second anchor for our soul is that God is all knowing. So not only does he have the strength, he has the mental intellect to know what, he, what, what you need to do. Because it's one thing to be all, all, all muscle and no brain, it's another thing to have the combo. Muscle and brain. He said, Pastor, what is that like? <laughs> I got, <laughs> I'm just kidding. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. Watch this. He knows about everyone everywhere. But he's not scared about everyone everywhere because he's still all powerful. But he's not watching from a distance. He's up close and personal. Why? Because he knows. And he knows because he cares. And he cares, so he's watching. Everything about us is bare wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. So not just a powerful God, not just an all. No, no. Living God. Which means he's still alive and well right now. Nothing can be hidden from him. So here's an anchor for our soul when we feel like the current of challenges is pushing us further into the ocean. Number one, God is all powerful. He still has all power and authority in his hand to right every wrong and bring justice to every injustice in your life. Secondly, he knows what to do. And thirdly, God is ever present. I love this. This is so comforting to every person going through a bad day. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, with boldness, the dove has a place to land. There is an oak of confidence. His name is Jesus. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. For everybody who's afraid in this season because of uh, the challenges that's causing your day to be a bad day or this season to be called a, 
a, a stressful season, you can say with confidence, I will not be afraid. What can people, what can challenges do to me? The answer is nothing, nothing, because God is all powerful. God is all knowing and God is ever present. With that as the backdrop, with that being the anchor in the character of Christ, what is the playbook to help us not just doggy paddle through life, but to thrive uh, uh, in the raft of life. Are you ready? Say go. Here's the first thing that I try to do. Second Corinthians reminds me, I want to focus. Everybody say focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're in a bad day, when you're in a bad season, don't focus on the negativity like a vulture looking for a carcass. Isn't that what, what, what uh, we tend to do? You know, and we just turn to vultures looking for dead things. Another red light. I knew it. Red lights. Devil's after me. Devil's not after me. It's a red light. It's a red light. Car's on empty again. That's what happens when you drive it. <laughs> but we start making up stuff in our mind, talking about how the devil's after us. No, no, no. Don't look for a carcass like a vulture. Look for life like a hummingbird. What we do is we focus on what's happening in me, not what's happening to me. See, God is a developer. And one, one way that God exchanges beauty from ashes and he takes the hardships of life and, they, and he makes them helpful in our spiritual development is this. He develops us through the pain. Now, God is good. He doesn't cause the pain, but he is good. He'll take the pain and cause it to work for you, not against you. He'll take the challenges that the devil meant for evil and God will turn it around and he'll use it for his glory and for your good. That happens when we recognize God is doing, God is developing, God is using this to do something in me, right? Pain has a lot of problems, but if we wanted to press and, and, and try to find something positive about pain is that pain will move you in a direction. It'll either cast you further out and see or draw you to the shores of the cross, draw you to the shores of Jesus, draw you to the shores of a faith-filled community. Now think about this, the same boiling water that will harden an egg will soften a potato. Maybe it's less about what we're going through and more about what we're made of. God says, I don't want you to be overtaken by the boiling water. I want to develop you to become a man and a woman of strength and power and courage and peace and rest and joy. We focus on what is happening in me, not to me. Let me say it like this. Same thing, but a different way. Your pain will either be a prison, a jail that imprisons you, or it will be a classroom to educate you. Every day, you're given the gift of a key. And the challenges we face will either be a jail sentence which imprisons us or a classroom that educates us. Come on. May we be a people that lay our head down at night finding an oak tree for the dove to land. My faith, my security, my confidence is in Christ. Amen. Going through pain. Second, second, second play in this biblical playbook is first is focus. Number two is remember that God always delivers. God always delivers. Well, he hasn't done it yet, but God always delivers. I wish he'd hurry up. Me too. Why hasn't he yet? I don't know. But I know that God is good and all things will work together for his glory and for our good. And if we just keep giving the author of time more time to work out everything according to his plan and his purpose, we will see with our own eyes that there is a finish line to pain and there is eternity of joy just around the corner. Oh, I know you're going through a challenge right now, but don't die in the pit. Don't give up in the pit. Don't deconstruct in the pit. Use the pit as a resting place for you to lay your head down and say, God, I can't do anything else. So will you take control? You take charge. I know you're all powerful. I know you're all knowing. And I know you're ever present, even in the pits of life. Remember that God always delivers. And there is a finish line to your pain. Everybody say, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Everybody say, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. It is. Pain is finished. And heartache has a finish. And tears have a finish. Finish, finish. It is finished. It is finished. It makes me think about one of the last statements Jesus made on the cross. A lot of people think that the last thing Jesus said before his death was, it is finished. And then he slumped his head and breathed his last. And then he gave up his life. Now, it happened 
pretty quick after he said, it is finished. But the phrase, it is finished, wasn't the last thing Jesus said. Later on, he'll go on to say one more thing, and then he died. So now I'm perplexed. Why did Jesus say, it is finished, if it really wasn't finished? You think you say, it is, the end means the end. Jesus is like, the end. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I got something else to say. He's saying it is finished and it wasn't finished just yet. And maybe there's part of the lesson that we need to take from the text. Jesus is saying it is finished, but there's still more. It is finished, but it comes to an end. It is finished. I'm not giving in. It is finished. I'm not giving up. It is finished. I'm keeping my eye on the prize. It is finished. I will fulfill my calling. It is finished. Joy really does come in the morning. It is finished. I'm done with sin. That part is finished. Jesus didn't have sin, but he bore our sin on the cross, right? That part of you, it is finished. There's a new life that is waiting to begin. There comes a point in time where you have to say, though this life is not finished, I'm finished with some things that are ruining my life. The dove finds a place to land. Jesus is your lifeguard. It is finished. We would call it, in seminary, we would call it the kingdom theology. Kingdom theology is is just a fancy way of saying right now, but not yet. Like something happened right now, but it hasn't fully transpired completely. So for example, let's say that you are adrift at sea and I threw this life ring out to you. And you're yelling, save me, save me, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And I say, I got you, boo. And I throw you that ring and, uh, and you say, I got it, thank you, I'm saved. You're only partially saved. Like you are saved, you're not going to drown, but now I got to get you to shore. So the salvation happened in an instant, but now I got to get you out of the water, right? The Bible says that when we surrender our life to Jesus in an instant, boom, in the, in the, in the, in the a blink of an eye, the Bible says our sin is washed away. His forgiveness, his love is so powerful uh, um, over our life. He takes all of our grime, all of our sin, all of our shame, all of the pain, all the hell that we were meant for, and then, and, then, and then he tosses it as far as the east is from the west. Watch me now. We're saved from hell, but we're also saved to Jesus. So we're saved from something, but now we're saved to something. So the moment of you giving your life to Jesus, congratulations, but now the fun really begins because your hope is the rope. And if it's anchored to Jesus, he's going to take you on one of the most exciting seasons of your life where you walk with him, you learn from him, you have a relationship with him, you're able to rediscover him and yourself in a whole new way. Remember, God always delivers. He doesn't always deliver how we want him to, but he's a good God who can be trusted and he will deliver when the time is right. Already, but not fully yet. How many of you... <coughs> How many of you, <laughs> sorry, smokers cough. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <clears throat> smoke, smoked a brisket. <clears throat> how, many of you, how many of you love TV shows? Like, like man, you just binge watching things. You just binge watching things. Man, I'm so old, honest. I'm so old that I remember the day and age before Netflix, before Hulu and all that kind of stuff. We would watch a television show on TV, and we had to wait an entire week for the next episode to come. How did we do that, y'all? How did we do that? We lived through the Great Depression. Like, that was crazy. The main actor, you know, you know, there's a gun to his head. He's forced with some dilemma. We don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to live? Is, is he going to die? What's going to happen to him? And we would have to wait a whole seven days to figure out what happened to Jack Bauer on 24, you know? <laughs> So one day I was tired. I was tired of being uh, sick and tired of waiting around for an entire week. So I got online and then I checked how many episodes does this guy star in this show? And he said he, he starred in all 12 of them. And we're on episode three. I knew right there he lives. He lives. They try to trick me at the end of every night, but he lives. I want to tell somebody who's going through the worst season of your life. 
that on your behalf, I've checked the last episode and I have found in Revelation 21, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with him and he will live with them forever. No more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain for the old order of things has passed away and we will live in the house of God. Not a day, not a season, not a week, not a month, but forever and ever and ever. Let me say the same thing. He lives. He lives, he lives, he lives, and because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, we know that we know that we know in our knower that we know we're going to make it. The weeping endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. Why? Because he lives. The life throws its worst at us and even tries to overtake us with death. If it does, we win. We get to spend eternity with Jesus. If God does a miracle and we live, we win. Either way, it's a win-win. When our anchor is connected to the character of Christ. Focus. Remember. And number three, we rely. We rely. We lean into solid, life-giving, biblically-minded, Jesus-loving healthy in their soul, fun to be around relationships. Well, where do I find those places? XR Church every Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Is our life perfect? No, but we have just seen God do some things in our life, and I've witnessed it. He will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our, notice that's plural, behalf for the gracious favor granted to us, me and you, you and other people, in answer to the prayers of all of us. Hey, you need somebody in your life that knows you and that you know knows you and is praying for you. Why do we have this propensity in humanity that whenever we begin to have a bout with doubt or we begin to deconstruct or we begin to wrestle with questions or life is really hard and we feel the undercurrent and the undertow of challenges um, take us further down the stream than what we would hope to be. Why is it that our first response is to isolate ourselves, Run away from the very thing that God wants to use to keep us tethered to the anchor. Why do we do that? I think it's because we're worried. Our pride gets in the way. Well, what are they gonna think? Are they going to judge me? No. If you're adrift at sea, you need people in your life. He says, hey, I recognize that you're in a storm. And the reason why I recognize it is because it's familiar territory. Because you see, I've been there too. I've seen pain in your eyes. And I recognize it because I saw it in the mirror. I see a spirit of hopelessness or I see you walking through some challenges. And I just don't want you to give up too soon. You're going to make it. So can I get in the raft of life with you and help paddle? When you're surprised by the blows of life, can I reach out and grab your wrist and keep you in the boat? Now's not a time for arrogance. Now's not a time for false humility. I got it all together. If you don't, you don't. But relationships like that, God uses to keep us anchored to his soul. And so now watch this. This is the story of the Bible from Old Testament to New. God looked over the balconies of heaven, the cruise ship of eternity, if you will, and he saw humanity drowning, drowning in their sin, struggling to survive. They were leaning on their own intellect and wisdom and might. They were, they were anchored to all the wrong things in life. God filled with compassion, not rage, love, not hate, attention, not animosity. He says, I see you drowning. Save me, save me, save me. And so he threw out what we would call in the Old Testament prophets, the spokesmen of God. And the people rejected the voice of the prophets. And so he threw out kings, people to guide them and direct them. We ignored them too. Then he threw out what we would call the judges, military leaders and CEOs, if you will, people with this, this divine touch of wisdom from God to lead them and their families and their nation well. The problem is we rejected him too. Every time they would pull us back to shore, we would swim out to sea. 
And so God said, I love you too much to keep throwing out life rings. So in the fullness of time, the Bible says that God decided to go himself. And he stepped out of eternity and he came to broken humanity. He said, I see you and I still love you. You're drowning, but you don't have to. You're in so much pain, but there is purpose behind the tears. Oh, if you would just give me the rope of your life, I will lead you to a destination you never thought imaginable. A place of rest and security you've only dreamed of. Right now you sit pretty in a, in a pew and you're jealous over other people's praise because they've witnessed it. But I've not seen them come through in my life. And so God didn't send a ring. He sent his son, Jesus. And so if God is the anchor for our soul, Jesus is the life ring we cling to. And the Bible says that our hope is the rope that draws us closer to him. And if we'll just stay with him, cling to him, like our life depended on it, because it does, he will bring us to an oak, an oak. There's a dove searching for a place to land in your life. It makes me think about Jesus. His first act of public ministry, he was baptized. He came up out of the water and a dove found an oak tree to land, found an oak tree of righteousness and peace and joy. It's found in Jesus. God is our anchor for our soul. Jesus is the life ring we cling to. For no man comes to the Father but through him. And so it's relationships that God uses to keep us grounded, to keep us faithful, to keep us encouraged in our spirit, right? And so needed in your life, so needed in my life. Makes me think then about the New Testament. Jesus had already died on the cross and ascended to the right hand of God. And this guy named Paul and his buddy Silas, they're traveling around and they're starting churches kind of like this one to remind people you have an anchor for your soul. His name is God. And you, and you meet him through Jesus. And uh, the Bible says that the town's officials, the leaders of that particular city, they didn't like the message that they were bringing, the story of Jesus. Because uh, not everybody likes where you decide to anchor your life. And sooner or later, you got to decide, do they mean more than what God means to your life, right? And so... Anyways, the Bible says they were arrested and they were beaten and they were flogged and they were bleeding and they're bruised up. Maybe their face is swelling and they're thrown into a Roman prison cell. You talk about having a bad day, they are having a bad day too. They really were. And it's 1145 at night and they're just, man, you can kind of sense they're frustrated. They'd have to be. These weren't angels, right? These were real people with real struggles, with real emotions. They're shackled, they're chained. It's a damp, cold Roman prison cell, dusty, dirty floor. They did nothing wrong, but they're treated wrong. And 11.56 uh, p.m. rolls around, and maybe Paul looked over at Silas and said, man, what do you want to do? And Silas says, I don't know. What do you want to do? And he says, I don't know. What do you want to do? You know, kind of like asking your wife where she wants to eat. You know, like, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And... Uh, and then Paul says, I don't know, what if we sing? And Silas says, for real? <laughs> for real, like that's what you wanna do? And, he, and Paul was like, well, do you have a better idea? Not really, okay, let's give it a try. And remember, these weren't, these weren't angelic beings filled with an abnormal amount of faith. I believe that they had to force their praise. They had to draw from a deep defiance against fear and lean into their spirit man to lean into their inside man of hope, reminding themselves there's still an anchor for my soul. There is still an oak for the dove to find refuge. And so maybe Paul's just like, what else are we gonna do? Praise, praise, praise. He is all knowing, praise, praise. He is all powerful, praise. Praise, he is ever present. Praise, wait a minute, if he was with Joseph in the pit, he can be with Paul in prison. Praise, wait a minute, wait a minute. You'll, I can almost hear it now. 
I know we're in the Roman prison cell, but my mind's taken back to the Old Testament. I can almost hear it. There's a dove on a distant oak that has found a refuge for its soul. Against the bouts of doubt and against the animosity of fear itself, something rises in the depths of Paul's spirit. He says, come on, Silas, praise, praise, praise the Lord. My soul has found a praiseworthy admiration against fear, against doubt, against sickness, against shackles, against pain, against poverty, against betrayal, against setbacks and negativity. It works. He works. He works all things together for the good and the glory of his name and for his people. Praise, praise the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this, watch this, watch this. That's all good. But unless the information becomes application, you'll never reach the art of transformation. Head knowledge is different than life experience. The Bible loves you so much, he doesn't want to just talk about God. He revealed God in the form of Jesus to us. But he doesn't want us just to be spectators of Jesus. He wants us to be participants with Jesus. That's why Jesus comes on the scene and he says, come to me. Everybody adrift at sea, doggy paddling through life. And I, Jesus, will, it's a promise. Give, it's a free gift. You, it's personal. The gift of salvation and hope and redemption. And Jesus, an oak of peace. Now watch this. I didn't do this the other two services, but I feel like doing it now. For some of you, you are going through the worst season of your life. And you have forgotten that God has given you his presence, his peace, and relationships for your need. His presence, his peace, and relationships for your need. And I just wonder, who am I talking to? You're going through the worst season of your life. And you would say, this message was just for me. Will you put your hand in the air? Will you put your hand in the air? Yeah. Yeah. You know what God wants to say to you? I love you, brother. He's got a plan for you and a purpose for you. I know you've been through some challenges. I know you've been through some heartache. I know you lost your dad way too early. Way too early. But he is still for you. He's not against you. He still champions your name. For the cross was for you. And it was well worth it. He's never regretted betting on you. Did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, the heart of God says, you're my daughter. You're loved. You're well pleased. You're an apple of his eye. He's proud of you. He sees you and he sees the tears you cry at night, but there's a purpose beyond the pain. It is finished, but he's not. The pain is finished, but he's not. Who am I talking to today? Raise your hand. Who am I talking to? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wish I could get to every one of you and I hope you come forward so I can. But you need to know this. There's a purpose in the pain. There are challenges in life. But there's an anchor for your soul. Why drift alone? You are made for more. Get in his presence. Fully surrender to him. Get in the context of relationships. And find the oak for the devil of your life to find its peace. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you would say, I don't have a relationship with God. To me, he's some religious figure, but today I recognize that God is doing something inside my spirit. I can't quite put it into words. I just recognize, I feel it on the inside of me. He's calling me. He's aware of me and he's, and he's beckoning me to come home. And it's not because he's mad at me. He's welcomed me, me home. You don't have a relationship with God, but you would say, today's my day. I fully surrender to him. I make him both the savior saving me from my sin, but also Lord, meaning he's in charge. Today, I make him savior and Lord to the best of my ability and with his grace and his help, I follow him. If that's you, loud and proud, put your hand in the air. Reach out towards heaven, hands across this place. 
I make him savior. God, forgive me of my sins. I make him Lord. I choose to follow you. You are in charge of my life. You are the great answer to the mystery of life. I have found the victim. I have found this golden mystery. His name is Jesus. I want to pray for you. And when I do, please, no one moving around. I've got another word of encouragement of encouragement for you for the robust faith of those who raise their hand surrendering their life to Jesus a concert of voices everybody please repeat after me dear Jesus thank you for the cross for your love for your grace for your mercy for your faithfulness for your kindness for your goodness thank you for knowing me you found me at my worst Lead me to your best. I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. I renounce them. I walk away from them. I cling to you. I make you both Savior and Lord. Now put your hands together and let's celebrate. Salvation has come to this place, breaking generational curses. Ha! Take it, devil. No, watch this, watch this. I also recognize, I also recognize that many of you are going through some significant challenges in life, some enormous pain. And again, this sermon's not gonna answer all those questions. Even I know that. Its goal is to provide assurance when answers are hard to find, that there's an anchor for your soul. And some of you, what you really need is to lean into that last point and to recognize there are some life-giving relationships that you need to lean into. There is something powerful about praying together. The Bible is replete with examples. If you have a need in your life, don't, don't, don't raft alone. Come forward and allow people to pray with you, believing that the same God who's alive and well is also attentive to our prayers. And the, and the, and the prayers of, of the saints, you will be healed in that situation. So our prayer partners are gonna come forward right now. We want to meet you. We want to link hands with you. We want to speak God's blessings over your life, God's favor in your life, God's clarity in your life. And we want to just pray with you across this place. Lift your hands upon this missile. Some of you are going to go home, go in the peace of God. Others of you, you're going to come forward and receive a miracle in Jesus' name. We believe it. Spirit of the living God, great tour guide that you are, great Savior, great Redeemer, great healer, and great friend that you are, great Lord above all lords, great King above all kings. We ask that you would make yourself known in a tangible way in our midst, in our challenges, in our circumstances. Be the oak of righteousness, the oak of joy and peace and salvation and healing healing and rest that we need for our dove in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 